Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Scott Melbourne and I am the Executive Director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts here at SOU. Please note that we have you all on mute and please stay on mute until the end of the talk. If you have any questions, please type those into the chat or save them for the end of the talk. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our special guest, Mel Prest, whose solo exhibition titled The Golden Hour opened just two weeks ago alongside her curated group exhibition titled Sensate Objects, which includes 13 artists from around the US. You can pick up your copy of the Sensate Objects catalog here at the museum, which includes an essay by Portland, Oregon-based art historian, curator, and critic Sue Taylor. Be on the lookout for the forthcoming catalog of Pretz's solo exhibition with an essay by New York City-based arts writer John Yao. Mel Press is a non-objective painter whose work is focused on color and perceptual visual relationships and has exhibited internationally. Recent solo shows beyond the Schneider Museum of Art include Time is Knots on a String at Gallery Urbane, Color Unfolding at Karen Imperial Fine Art. Her works have been included in group shows at the Drawing Center in New York, the Weatherspoon Museum of Art, Saturation Point Acme Studios, Zeitgeist Gallery, IS Projects, the uh, uh, lead in the Netherlands um, Pentimenti Gallery in Philadelphia. Press has been awarded artist residencies at Ragdale, the Sam and Adele Golden Artist Foundation, Wallapa Bay, the Wasaic Project, Vermont Studio Center, and Bullseye Glass, among others. Press received her BFA in painting from Rhode Island School of Design and her MFA from Mills College in Oakland, California. Press has taught at Mills College, San Francisco State University, and, and adult education courses at San Francisco City College, San Francisco Art Institute, California College of the Arts, and Root Division. She is currently an advisory board member of Root Division, a nonprofit arts organization in San Francisco, and served as a board member from 2012 to 2014. Press served as the advisory board of the Art Monastery Project uh, in Calvi della Umbria in Labro, Italy from 2007 to 2010 and on the artist advisory board for Trestle Gallery in Sunset Park neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. As an independent curator, Press has organized shows in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and the Bay Area, New York, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Berlin, Munich, and Zagreb. She is also a founding member of Transmitter, a collaborative curatorial gallery initiative in Bushwick area of Brooklyn, uh, excuse me, of Brooklyn, New York. Please join me in welcoming Mel, Mel Prest. Hi Mel, how are you? Hi, thanks everybody. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces here too. I'm uh, thrilled to have been invited to talk today and of course a little nervous, so I'm, I'm just gonna go for it. Thanks, Mel. I've made you a co-host. You can share your screen and get started whenever you are ready. Okay. Um, okay, so can you see a picture of me as an 18-year-old uh, teenager? This is my freshman year at RISD, um, and uh, I have a mohawk. Um, I wanted to uh, just give you a little background. I haven't always been um, an abstract painter. Uh, this is the kind of painting I was doing in my studio and my poor studio mate had to put up with me having slices of meat or fish in my studio rotting slowly as I painted them in thick gooey oil paint. Um, fast forward to um, graduate school. I went to Mills College out in Oakland, California, and I still live in San Francisco. Um, these are some big goopy oil paintings that I did. Um, when I was working away from the figure, working away from figuration into um, sort of the, the space around the figure and thinking about mark making and um, large works. Uh, but I also wanted to spend some time uh, talking about the influences and the changes that came about in the work 
Um, so uh, some of the people who I really admire are uh, Joseph Albers, um, the way that he really looked at color and color positioning using um, a maximum of three hues for this series homage to the square, which is something that I also do in my work. There are three colors present, the background, the first line layer and the second line layer. Um, I also was profoundly influenced by Robert Irwin and his show Homage to the Square, which is an homage to Joseph Albers. This was uh, installed at DIA in New York um, in Chelsea. And these are scrim, layers of scrim with fluorescent lights. Um, and he created all these different rooms. So it felt like you were continuously walking in and out of paintings and seeing kind of these in between spaces, which felt very magical. Um, I'm also very interested in Bridget Riley. Um, there's a wonderful book out by her where she talks about her uh, early influences, which I could really relate to, of being kind of a feral child running around looking at light um, and color in landscape and just um, that sort of wordless place of experiencing and experiencing light and nature and color. And finally, Judith Scott, who's a who is a neurodivergent artist, um, and she worked with a lot of color, pre-existing forms, sort of wrapping and kind of obsessively covering and uncovering and revealing. But her color sense, um, to me, is just exquisite. And uh, also, um, everyday objects, I feel like uh, nature and everyday objects are some of the most exciting things. Um, this is a fan that I uh, purchased when I was in Dakar, Senegal. And I love the patterning and I love how the pattern builds up and breaks down and the edging uh, is created from a blue tarp. Um, I feel like it's the adding a softness to hard edge painting is something I'm very interested in. Um, yeah, and then looking out the window and just looking at the light and the things that arise from watching the light and the sky change all the time. Um, I wanted to talk about a few places that I feel like I made some progress in my work. One is the Wasaic Project Artist Residency. This is in um, upstate New York. It's about 130 miles maybe from New York City and you can take the train directly there. Um, it's a little tiny mill town with not much going on. Um, and I was there in May and it was entirely green except for this one red tree that like I would go on walks and I would see this tree and just um, kind of talk to the tree because it, it just felt kind of out of place and beautiful, um, which eventually inspired a painting of experiencing, trying, trying to show or re-experience that tree. Um, yeah, and color just being in this space. This was one of the uh, this was one of the artist houses I shared with five other people. And one day, somebody came home and brought some wildflowers. So these were sort of just the colors that were around all the time. Coincidentally, I was working on a painting in this barn studio that um, was all the same colors of that bouquet that came into the house. So I love the way that the surroundings and nature are sort of always coming into my work and being open to that because I feel like it's sort of a never ending, always changing place. Um, additionally, so this is like an overhead view. I showed you um, in the early slide uh, being up in top of the mills in um, Wissaic. This is like almost the extent of the entire town. So my studio is off to the right um, down this, this road here. I'm sorry, I can't use the cursor to show you. And then the house I lived in was up to the upper left. And so I would walk home at like five o'clock in the morning from being in studio and I couldn't see anything, but it was safe and it was dark outside, but I could smell these lilacs everywhere. And it was just um, like, otherworldly. It was so beautiful to be able to walk through a dark space and, and smell these uh, flowers. So um, when I came home and was working in my studio, I created this painting called Lilac Aura, 
um, using acrylic and mica and trying to get that feeling of sort of overwhelm of that um, heady fragrance. And that painting is a similar painting to the one behind me. So if this gives you a sense of scale, um, I'm gonna do a little backup here and you can just see how big this work actually is. So this is a five foot panel. And I use a very tiny brush and a lot of lines um, to create these spaces. Um, and then this is a show that I had when I uh, returned to uh, San Francisco. This was at a gallery called Chandra's Dorito Contemporary. Um, the painting Lilac Aura is on the left, um, uh, straight ahead of you, is the fog, or my interpretation of the fog. There are 49 panels uh, that relate to the 49 hills of San Francisco. Um, the New York Times has greatly um, uh, it has has exaggerated greatly the depth of the fog in San Francisco. The fog will always be here. So <laughs> we are always living with the fog, but all these beautiful translucent layers that sort of capture and reflect color are uh, part of um, a great influence for me as well. And this whole show actually was really um, uh, triggered by my residency at the Wasaic Project, really, um, thinking about color and also thinking about scent. So uh, the painting on the left is called um, Mock Orange. And that is a tree that we have out here that is beautiful, has white flowers, um, and I'm very allergic to it. Every time I bring it in the house, it's gorgeous and smells like orange and vanilla together, um, but it makes me sneeze. Um, the second painting is called Sun Cloud and the third painting is called Morning Glory. So yeah, I'm kind of always taking these pictures of these liminal spaces of like the sun moving through the cloud, looking at the sky, the skies I was changing, getting really excited about those things that change. Um, this is, uh, we just spent some time in Oaxaca and I was totally um, entranced by like the, just the way that this tree is, is holding um, these streamers. And I kind of feel like this is one way I would like my paintings to feel a lot of the time. Um, sorry about that sound. Anyway, um, this, this painting is called Sky Watcher. Um, and it's the same size, it's a five foot square, working with um, a gray overpainting to, to kind of limit that blue and think about that space of sky. Um, this is a view from my house. Uh, every year during uh, Pride Month, they put up a pink triangle on Twin Peaks. And I love how the um, hot pink or the fuchsia LCD, LCDs um, or LEDs, sorry, um, light up this gray, gray sky. And then a sunset um, harmonizing with my painting or my painting harmonizing with a sunset in my studio. This is the painting. Um, it's funny, a while ago, somebody told me that um, if you wanted to not get picked for jury duty, you should wear orange and purple together when you go to jury service. But I actually think like orange and purple are probably the best colors to paint together with because they're so floral. And um, I just like how they kind of make this like brownish color. So anyway, uh, you'll see a lot of pink, orange and purple in my paintings. And I'm always just taking pictures of like weird things like this is at home, like one day our window just cracked for no reason. Um, and like, I love the reflection of the light in the broken bits. And then just noticing how like, you know, like a work on paper kind of rhymes with that. So I'm always looking for something that's unexpected. Um, this was a trip that we took um, to for my 49th birthday. I'm not sure. We went up to um, Canada to an island um, where there were no large mammals. And so um, we were just surrounded by ravens all the time. And the ravens were the largest and they were talking all the time. So I started really getting excited about sound. And so um, 
when I reload my brush in the paintings, that's what creates this sort of darker concentric circles. And normally I hide that because um, I just was, I don't know, trying to be perfect or something. And I realized if I started to leave that um, circular pattern in there, it was kind of interesting. And it reminded me of sound and sound waves. And so that's something that um, is present also in the show at the Schneider Museum. Um, this work, uh, Cloud um, or Summer Penumbra um, is at the Schneider Museum as well. And it looks so different in a still slide. So I wanted to um, show just a video. And something I, I really like is just how um, the camera kind of can't see it. So it starts to flicker and which I feel like is the way that I see it is just, you know, this kind of flickering space. Um, the title Summer Penumbra comes from, um, you know, just the uh, summer is a time that so many people love because it's so um, open and sunny and wild and free. But for me, I think, like I'm always like oh summer summer's a little hard so, you know sad things happen in the summer so this is actually a painting I made for my mentor Hung Lu who um, was a fantastic artist um, and my mentor at Mills College I was very lucky to know her um, she also introduced me to my now husband of 22 and a half years so um, she's a very special person and this painting ended up being for her um, I also wanted to show you the back of some of my small paintings. Um, you know, it's funny how when you look at a painting, it seems so clear in the beginning. And then, um, you know, I, I went through a lot of thinking before this painting was complete, a lot of different. So these are all the color layers um, starting at the lower left that were underneath the painting. So the fluorescent yellow is actually the top layer um, after you know, 11 or 12 tries to try to find the thing that actually um, looked good. Um, this is a residency at Willapa Bay, um, which is up in uh, Southern Washington state. It's a beautiful place. Um, all the blue like land and sky and tides just made me um, really excited. So when I came home, this is the painting that came from that time. Um, and I just wanted to show you, I started taking some in-process shots because I think it's hard to, when you see an entire thing to know like what is the, how was it made? So I make, um, I start kind of with an X and I use a straight edge for that X in the center of the painting. And then I work out. Now you can see um, my studio is looking very messy at that point, but you can see how I'm working. I work flat on a table. I mix my colors in a cup. Um, I store them in glass jars, um, and then I discard them when the painting is complete. So this is me standing on a step stool, so you can see the full first layer of the painting, and then how that energy changes when you add that second layer. I think it's kind of amazing, like just how, yeah, just how adding three colors together can create such a different feeling. Yeah, I'm, I take pictures of the sky all the time and all the dear, weird light things. This was a plant we owned for a really long time. It's called a monkey tail. I love it so much. Unfortunately, it, it didn't survive all the overwatering. Um, this is um, this is a firefly that my husband has caught when we were in Iowa, and it's a. Uh, what inspired um, the painting Firefly that's in the show. I had never really experienced fireflies and um, they're such a magical thing. I mean, I don't know. I just think that nature is, is probably the most magical thing that we can ever experience. And the colors that we're allowed to see are just outrageous. So um, this is the painting complete. Um, living in California, we have so many colors of bougainvillea. Um, 
So being able to make these sort of long paintings that describe that feeling of the flowers that kind of drape and um, change color. Um, this quick um, project, I did at Marin General Hospital where I collaborated with a glass shop. They recreated my five uh, inch square paintings. Um, we worked together and I chose the colors. And then I did a, a wall drawing in this space. This is the first time I've used tape, but I used it wrong because it's totally um, uh, irregular. But I liked the idea of allowing this um, to feel like the sun um, shining on a wall, you know, when you have the sun coming into a room. And then I installed um, the paintings or the glass pieces on top. And the glass pieces refer to the local flowers like California poppy and iris. And, um, and then you can see the side view as well. Um, but this was exciting to do because it's actually um, at a maternity uh, floor. So people who are coming in to have children um, or to have babies are seeing um, things that deal with nature and change. Um, just gonna flip through a few things that kind of rhyme with the paintings that I make. This painting is also in the show. It underwent a lot of changes. Both of these did. Um, and I love that my friend Carrie here went to my show and she is dressed exactly in the colors of this ladder piece in the yellow, the blue, the black, and then the silver clogs. So again, magic just kind of happens. Um, collaboration. Painters are, I, I'm a terrible collaborator when it comes to painting, which is why um, curation is so ex important to me. Um, this is my friend Gray, who um, I gave this painting uh, to his mom, Rhea. It's up above on the wall. He was so excited by it that he started to collaborate on the wall about the painting. This is my friend Sarah. We um, had the opportunity to show um, a whole bunch of artwork in uh, Europe. And so this is how the artwork traveled. We had very few clothes and a lot of art pieces. Um, we created our own uh, catalog called Doppler Stop. It was for a show that she had curated of stop and go animation and a show I had curated of the artworks made by these artists who were in the show. There's me um, 12 years ago installing some work in Rotterdam um, and my first foray into using um, a concrete drill or hammer drill. Um, and it is so exciting to be able to show the work in these spaces and when there's not um, funding, being able to carry everything clearly in your suitcase having people trust you, come out and see the shows, experience the work, getting to visit artists in their studio. This is Henriette Van Hoog and my friend, Sarah Klein. Henriette is an amazing artist who lives in Amsterdam. She was born there. She does these beautiful um, metal uh, paintings that are uh, painted and then um, they, they look like they have dimension. They don't actually have a lot of dimension. They're just gorgeous. Um, and then being able to work with a, a place where you're like, oh, you can't put any holes in the wall here. And this was another place in Amsterdam where we showed the work. But it's exciting because, you know, working alone in your studio, it's probably the most fun when you get to work uh, with people that you like and meet other artists. So um, Imke van Dyck, um, Steve Barris, Deborah, Deborah Ramsey, Gay Outlaw, Edgar Deal, and Stephen Main are all in this work, in this show. Um, and then this is the show at Parallel Art Space in Bushwick, which is how I first met Rob De Auda, and who's a great painter, and um, some of the New York people. This is a work in progress being installed by Gilbert Chow. There's Gilbert installing this amazing piece that's based on a very small collage um, that he then created wall size. Um, uh, on the left is 
Uh, up above is Henriette, on the left is Don Voisin, on the right is Jose Hirkins. Um, this show was then taken to the New Jersey, uh, the Art Center in Summit, New Jersey by Mary Birmingham, who's a fantastic curator. This is a wonderful way to be able to collaborate with people when they're like, I like your show. And I'm like, great. And so they install it in their own um, gallery and have a lot of um, help in terms of installation. Um, my husband had a residency for uh, three months. And so we moved to New York. This is our cat getting used to living in Fort Greene um, in 2014. And I became part of a gallery. I was a co-founder of Transmitter, which still exists and actually just got its first New York Times review. Um, it's a fantastic gallery that uh, four of us started or five of us started to just try show other people's work, show work that wasn't being exhibited and to try different things out. So I reconstituted the Doppler show for Transmitter. And somewhere uh, during this period of time is when I first met Scott. Um, this is Karen Schifano's work, Ruth Van Bainen, um, Richard, uh, I'm gonna draw a total blank here, I'm sorry, Albert Roskam, and then uh, one show that I, one part of the gallery is that we never talked about who curated what show, but I'm gonna show you a few shows I did curate. Um, I curated a show of people who put things out in public um, who, that are not invited. So the show is called Not Invited and um, people who made things out of paper, people who did yarn bombing. And then my friend Niels Post who lives in Rotterdam, um, gets all these spam announcements in his, uh, you know, in, in his email. So he goes and puts these up um, illegally on different windows and then also has started carving the words out of wood. Um, my friend Victoria Scott makes these items from Second Life, like the garbage bag, um, and puts them out in the street. They're all just cut paper. And uh, London, who's in the foreground, does yarn bombing. And Emmanuel Sevilla um, is a painter and he, these are all made out of paper and gold leaf. He's a letterist also. So using um, the technique for creating um, mosaics and using a punch tool for making his tide. This is uh, Patricia Zarate who works with small um, forms to create larger forms. Um, she's installing in the transmitter space with Deborah Ramsey, who's assisting her making a very large um, and very graphic, beautiful painting. Um, and then getting to uh, collaborate with uh, Kirk Stoller on this show called Echo Spectrum. Um, this was a show we did at Trestle Art Space. This is Anna Kuntz. Um, Sarah Bednarek, Nalika Belchins, and Kirk is on the right. Unfortunately, Kirk is no longer living. Um, he has a piece in the show at the museum currently. On the left is Viv Vivian Collins with one of her pieces for both gifts. This is a Kirk Stoller sculpture as well. And this is a, this is a curation I did in San Francisco at Root Division taking artists of many different backgrounds together to create a show um, that is called Fundamental Complications. Uh, this piece on the right is by Sandra, Wong, uh, Sandra Ono. And Sandra um, works with sand and glue and glitter. And this entire piece is made of sand and glue and glitter. It's really incredible. Um, her work is all dedicated to her namesake. Um, these pieces are by uh, Arthur Huang, who lives in Tokyo. He is a neurobiologist and he does a charting of all the different walks he takes every day. So each egg is a different day's walk. Sometimes they're um, just to work and back, and sometimes they're to the corner store. 
So it's, it's pretty interesting um, to see. I feel like part of curation is actually looking at all the art that you love and trying to bring it all together so that the artist can have a conversation either visually or, you know, if you're lucky, uh, like in the case of the Schneider Museum in person, being able to be in the same space. So, um, and it's a way to collaborate together, trying to show everyone's work in the very best possible light and bring it together. Um, I know that we're running short on time. Um, I wanted to show you a collaboration I did with my husband. We were at a beautiful gallery here called The Great Highway. Um, we did a number of shapes. This was in the beginning of the pandemic when San Francisco was completely shut down. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how we could work together because he's a sculptor and because I work with paint and color. So I did this wall drawing that took me like um, a full like 24 hours. And um, then we consulted on the color and, re and, and painted these shapes together. The shapes were of his design, just thinking about um, all the different ways that they could look or be. And this is what the walls look like when I drew over them um, and then they got painted over a month later. But it was a really great experience, um, you know, just trying to work with somebody who works so differently. There we are in uh, July 2020, um, sitting in the storefront, which was the way a lot of things were open here. Uh, things were just open in storefronts. Um, finally, um, talking a little bit about Sensate Objects, I think it was such a, um, an amazing turnout for the show. And I hope if you haven't seen the show, you'll get a chance to see it. The museum created an incredible catalog for the show. And, um, and Sue Taylor's essay is just um, phenomenal and really brings together so much about all these artists, you know, making things that they're making for themselves. I mean, she just um, puts it so well. And I don't, I think it's an, an amazing undertaking to write about 13 people whose work you may not have experienced before. And I think um, everything that she said really um, honors the work and, and it's, worth, it's worth a read and a read again because uh, it's just beautiful how everyone's work came together here. Um, and then there's my work installed. And I think um, it was just such a treat and a treasure to be able to work with Scott and Maureen. And I'm so grateful that I got this opportunity, this, it was my first opportunity to show in a museum and to have so much more space um, to stand back from the work and to share the work with a wider audience. Um, yeah, and, you know, making these big paintings look so um, small or just the right size. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Mel. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, uh, we will open it up for questions. You all have the option to unmute yourself and share your video if you want to ask Mel di directly, or if you want to type any questions into the chat, I am happy to read them out loud. Um, I wanted to say one more thing, actually, I see um... Emma Golden is on this call. Um, the Golden Foundation is um, the most fantastic, wonderful residency where I learned everything about switching from oil paint to acrylic paint. They also own Williamsburg paint and they make a beautiful watercolor line as well. But the incredible generosity of space and being able to go to a residency for free and to absorb the landscape and just all the love in their family business that's been around for, gosh, um, you know, since the mid century, like just was um, the most supportive thing. So sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to bring that up. Thank you. That's great, Mel. Thank you. And thank you, Emma. Um, there is a question in the chat. The question is, as a professor at Mills College, how did you introduce students to abstraction? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
I think one thing I did was um, I, my painting class would be like, uh, we would start working um, with black and white photographs. So we would start just with shapes and forms. And then once we did that, we would work with the color wheel. And then once we would work with the color wheel, then we would start thinking about um, trying to either compose images out of found images, um, sometimes uh, working around a feeling. Um, when I worked at SF State, I um, showed uh, the advanced painting class, uh, a couple of videos by artists, or I gave them like a Robert Frost poem um, and ask them to interpret it in the way that they wished. So sometimes the abstraction was from an object and sometimes it was, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was taking an object and working out from it. And sometimes it was um, trying to be as, as unlimited as possible and just an openness. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Mel. Um, once again, if you want to ask Mel a question directly, you could um, unmute yourself and share your video. While you think about it, I'll read from the chat. Other than the X that was straight edged on your five by five paintings, were the rest of the vectors hand drawn? Yeah, they're all hand drawn and wiggly and let me see if I can find you a particularly wiggly part behind me. Um, you know, they're cumulative and so they rely on each other. Um, but yeah, they end up getting quite wiggly uh, because, you know, my hand gets tired <laughs> and, I, and I need to quit for the day or I'm over caffeinated and I need to, um, I need to slow it down a little bit. But I, um, yeah, I kind of like it because I, I, I love the um, movement, you know, uh, and the um, spontaneity of like what happens, what happens when that line gets a little bit goopy, like, and then do I shift things a little bit more and kind of straighten it back out or I do I go with that curve that starts to happen? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Mel, I have a question. We mm -hmm. introduce you in the catalog as an artist who wears many hats and is an arts worker. Uh, we talk a little bit about artists who do art writing, artists who do curating, artists who take jobs and positions working for nonprofit arts organizations. Um, how important do you think the arts worker is to the arts ecology? Um, I think that like the, the arts worker is the arts ecology. The arts worker ends up being in all the different places. Um, I think I think it also brings um, like a greater sense of empathy. Like I, I don't write about all the places that I interned at. I um, interned at so many places for free or just helped out at places. Cause I, I got to learn about, um, you know, how to, how to hang a show, how to um, work with other people, how to collaborate, how to not always get my way, you know, like it's, it's, it's a whole kind of ecosystem and it's, and it's nice, like maybe the most fun part for some people is being in their studio and being by themselves. And I think for other people, it's like meeting other artists. And, you know, if you have, if you have something that you can share, like opportunities or knowledge on a subject, it feels really good to be able to share that. Um, Cause yeah, yeah, hopefully I'll get to um, help each other move forward. Uh, thanks, Mel. To expand on that a little bit, as we do have some undergraduate fine art students on this Zoom, this uh -huh. is being recorded and later edited and put on our website for other students to watch. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how would, how, to what degree would you encourage a young artist to participate beyond their personal studio practice? Oh, 10. I mean, I think that uh, it's really great to make your art for yourself and that that can't 
be overstated. Like you make your art, make the art you want, make the art for yourself. But I also think it's like, there are all these great people who are making super interesting things um, who, who are all around you and um, going and doing studio visits, inviting yourself over to do a studio visit, assisting artists. I assisted a number of artists, um, Ron Nagel and Hung Lu among them. Um, you know, uh, yeah, just helping other people for free. Like um, there's a great organization in San Francisco called Root Division that gives um, uh, subsidized studio space to artists. It teaches them how to teach. It teaches them how to install work. It gives them shows. Those kind of organizations are so fantastic because you just get people coming from all different places and levels together. And it's the world we spend a lot of time in or hopefully spend a lot of time in. Thank you, Mel. Uh, we still have some more time if anybody at home has any questions. If not, then uh, I would like to end by saying, Mel. Oh, I see Sue. I see Sue. Yep. Okay, we also Sue raising your hand, and we got. I'll get to. Let's see here, Sue. Can you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Mel. I have a couple of questions about your own painting. I really appreciate um, the way you informed us about how attentive you are to color in nature and your appreciation for light and space via Robert Irwin and his generation. Also, certainly the optical effects produced by Bridget Riley, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, Remaining to me, however, is the question of structure, the underlying structure, how that differs from one painting to another, how you, how you begin, and um, what, what the structure means in terms of content. I have some thoughts about that, but I'm curious about where that all comes from. Um, well, the color is like a totally that the background color is one thing that's like a color that I see or feel like usually I have like a feeling um, to it and then uh, the X shape has been like prevalent mostly because of trying to think about the shape of the square and work with the square. Um, but then like the overlayer is kind of like air. Like I love, um, I do love a, a Japanese landscape painting where the air and the wind are always um, present, you know, in the scroll painting uh, that they have form. So trying to give some form to feelings or form to emotions or form to a weather pattern, I think. And then that top layer is, um, is really spontaneous. So I'm sort of working with it as it happens, um, like knitting a sweater, maybe. Thank you, Mel. And from the chat from Emma, first of all, I love the Mohawk, bring it back. <laughs> but I never knew you were painting so realistic early on. Can you speak to that change? Yeah, I mean, the short version, and it's, um, and it's really personal, but um, I'm happy to share it is uh, the short version is when I went to school in the 80s, uh, people were, you know, figurative work was really in and I was really into Lucian Freud and I was really into Heim Soutine and a lot of these sort of gushy painting people. And um, so then I, I took that and worked um, in my uh, family and using some family photos. Uh, as well. And so painting family. And then, um, and then my mom got sick. Um, when I was in grad school, uh, she got brain cancer. And so uh, I didn't feel good about making pictures of my family anymore. It was more about how we were interrelating, which is why I was doing sort of um, 
drawing and language in the paintings because that was something that we were losing between us. And I also realized um, at that point, I um, was, I had this big heavy painting bag of going to school and learning all this stuff about painting. And it was like thick gushy oil painting and that was the way you paint. But honestly, like when I all kind of went away, um, I realized my interest was in light and color. And so um, brushwork, which I had been doing these, you know, heroic, you know, oil painting strokes um, was somebody else's mark and not mine. And so using a single brush felt like that was the size of my voice and then bringing all those together made sort of this larger form. So I took away the figure and just worked, I've just worked with line and color since 2000. Uh, we are out of time. Mel, I just want to say thank you so much for working with us, sharing your work, curating an exhibition, uh, working with Sue Taylor with the essay, our designer for the catalog. Can't wait for your catalog to be finished. John Yao has shared some wonderful words about your work that our audiences are uh, enjoying. I want to note how kind and giving you are of talking about other artists and their work here in your presentation. I think that is a great testament to kind of the kind of arts worker you are and community builder, which is essential. Um, you know, we build our communities. So I want to thank you for that, Mel. And thank you, everybody here. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate seeing you. Thank you for being here. And um, yeah, please uh, check out the catalogs uh, that the museum uh, has on view and like go to the museum. And um, thank you again so much, Maureen and Scott for everything 